Good evening. I'm, I'm so impressed you braved the elements and look at look at look at Donald there laughing. This is this is spring weather where you're from. Wow. Well that makes one of us. We were in the South because, uh, because of God's grace. Amen? Bob and Patty, weren't, weren't, they, didn't get, you know, they didn't get out here until a few years back, but Bob told me ever since they, they made it here, this is as close to paradise as they could ever hope for. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, get you an island or something out there. Well, we're glad you're here tonight, and uh, there are kids upstairs and, and uh, children in one hall and youth in the other, and we want to pray for them as well. And if you know folks that are battling uh, illness, there's a lot of stuff going around, and uh, I just wish you'd just get out, don't you? And uh, move on because we don't have time for that stuff. And so uh, let's pray tonight to, to, for, our, for our faith family. Uh, um, Gilbert, uh, Gilbert, Gilbert, Gilbert uh, Lucero, who many of you know him, his brother was killed in an accident this morning, and we want to keep that family in prayer. Uh, we want to, anybody else have issues or family or any, anything? Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Absolutely. Wow. Come on in, Chris. wish you had that much energy Sam Samuel yes R remember Samuel uh, Hannah and James little boy anybody else your father-in-law Sam with me would you and reach over and take the hand of that person beside you if you, if you can father we thank you for the privilege of agreement you said that if two or more agree as concerning anything, that our request would be answered by our Father in heaven. And this, this evening, Father, you've heard our needs. You know every single situation, whether an infant like Samuel or someone more advanced in years. Father, we know our help comes from you. And we pl plead the blood of Jesus over every sick body, over every, every hurting family, over every burdened parent. Father, we, we just we, we, we thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for your mercies, for your healing power. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate price to, to purchase healing for every person who believes in your covenant. And so, Father, we lift up every family to you tonight that is dealing with something. We pray in the name of Jesus for restoration, for healing, and for wholeness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Lord, for Samuel. Lord, the, the, the doctors are trying to figure things out. Lord, we... We, we thank you for medical science. It's a, it, they, are, they, are, they are, in many ways, a miracle worker. But, Father, you are the great physician, and we trust you. So, God, just intervene in that situation and do for that child what medicine cannot do and raise him up as a sign and evidence of your might and your power. We commit him to you in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. And we're so grateful that when we open the Word of God that that, that, that the, the greatest teacher in the universe is present. And so, uh, Lord, speak to us tonight. Give us insight and revelation. And we promise to give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, if you would, for just a minute. If you didn't, Philippians chapter 2. If you, didn't, if you didn't get a handout, you just Diane would be more than happy to take care of you. You know, when we, when we talk about, about Jesus, and of course the Gospel of John is the story of Jesus primarily, and, and uh, not in synoptic form, but in, in, uh, in terms of 
just the divinity and miraculous nature of his life. And uh, in Philippians, it, it's, it says this. It's in verse number five. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I want you to pay special attention to verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It's one thing to be forced to take a, an inferior position or a secondary position. It's another to voluntarily do it. The Bible says, one, one translation says Jesus emptied himself. He, all that he had and all that he was and all that he is to come in the flesh for, you, for your sake and for mine, he emptied himself. He laid aside his God prerogatives. He could have done anything. He could have spoken at a word. Anything that he said would have been done because the Bible says there's nothing that was made that was not made by him. And so with one word, with one syllable, everything that Jesus could have wanted to do to, 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 to uh, avert the, the pain and suffering and misery he would have, that he, was, he knew he was going to suffer. He could have said, no, I'm not doing it. But he humbled himself. You know, you and I, we live in a generation... This isn't one of the signs that John talks about tonight, but when you, when you see many of the things Jesus did, and we're going to talk about all of them, all of them you see someone who, he, he has, who knowing all things, yet he made himself just like me and Don, just like, just like Mary, just like Patty, just like Angela. It's amazing. And so... The reason, when I think of, of Jesus, when I think of John's gospel, I think one of the reasons why John went last, he got to enjoy Jesus uh, the longest in terms of his physical life and uh, the memories of Jesus. And then, can you imagine what he, what, what he must, have, what mis, must have gone through his mind when, when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, comes and, and breaks bread with him on the, on the seashore? You, may, you remember that? And so, uh, when, he's, when he's writing... When you read John's gospel, you, you see it's so much more. It's not just a synopsis or a, a, a summary. It's a, it, it's, it's a love letter. And, uh, but just next time that you think about Jesus, remember, we're, going, we're about to celebrate Christmas in a few weeks, and we all focus on the baby. But he was only that way once. Amen? And uh, he's exalted back where he, he belongs at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. And so tonight, whatever needs you have, and if we didn't cover it earlier, you, you, uh, you always have a high priest with, with the Father, and he's always eager to hear your prayer. This is part 11, and I want to thank, uh, though he's not here tonight, Michael uh, Penny for uh, stepping in for me and, and uh, helping uh, us. Uh, I love when he teaches. I know some people, I've heard some say, well, he's over my head. Well, everything in the Bible is over my head, too. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so... I love when Michael teaches. I always learn something. I love to kid him about it, too, because I see him three or four times a week. But I do appreciate uh, his, uh, his helping out and his, his teaching. First John chapter 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Everything we read and, and consider uh, in John's gospel is, 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 a, is an impetus for joy. If, if, if you, uh, 
if you, you realize, you, how many understand that you can improve your face value, right? Watch this. Let me look at your neighbor and just sh flash those pearly whites. See, when you, read, when you read John's gospel, it's a reason for joy. See, there's one thing I don't get. I don't get depressed Christians. I'm sorry, I just don't get it. Talk to me, somebody. If Jesus conquered the grave and said, because I live, you live also, what is there to be worried about? Amen? This is what the word says in John chapter 20. And truly, Jesus did many other signs, somebody say signs, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. The word Christ is, is from the Greek word Christos, and it means the anointing of the anointed. It's, it's something that oozes out from uh, 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 its essence, just keeps coming. The anointing of the anointed one. Jesus is the anointing of the anointed one, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John, 1 John 5 says, He who believes in the Son of God has this, the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has, made him, uh, God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son, somebody say, that's me. He who has the Son has life. Hallelujah. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. There's a lot of things about John's Gospel that are unique, and one of them is the number seven. You'll see it on, your, on the slides there in your binder. Uh, there are seven signs. Uh, if someone asked once, what's the difference between a miracle and a sign? I will tell you what the, the difference is. The, the miracles point to the kingdom. The signs point to the king. Let's say it one more time. The miracles point to the kingdom of God. The signs point to the king, Jesus. So what Jesus did, and we're going to talk about this tonight, he, he turns water into wine. He heals a nobleman's son. He healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda who had been there for 38 years. He fed 5,000 men and women and children. He walked on water. He healed a man born blind. He raised Lazarus to life. Seven teachings in John's gospel. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is living water. Jesus is one with the Father. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Seven I am statements. I am, Jesus says, the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And you notice there at the bottom of that slide, seven is symbolic in, uh, in, in uh, Eastern and uh, Israelite culture and literature because it communicates a sense of fullness. And I apologize because I, I tried my best to get those Hebrew, uh, Hebrew letters uh, separate. I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. But anyway, what you see there, those funny-looking things, that's the actual Hebrew uh, letters that, that uh, spell seven or, uh, or complete. And so... They're identical. The number seven means complete or full. And this is why uh, we, we understand when Jesus did these things, you know, the seven teachings, the seven miracles, the seven statements, but he was trying to say, I'm the complete revelation uh, of all that you need to know about God. C.S. Lewis, uh, the, the phenomenal author and uh, man who came to late knowledge of, of uh, Christ in his life, he said, miracles or signs are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. So everything we see in, in John's gospel, these signs we're going to talk about tonight are evidences that, uh, that Jesus is Lord. Can somebody say amen? So here's what we're going to talk about this evening. Jesus saves the best for last. John 2, he heals and makes whole. John chapter 4. Jesus restores body and soul. John 5. Little is much in the hands of Jesus, John chapter 6. Jesus has power over nature, John chapter 6. Jesus gives sight, in, sight, gives sight in two dimensions, John 9. And Jesus has conquered death. Hallelujah, somebody. So, if you have your Bible with you, 
I did not put these scriptures on the slides because it would have taken about 40 more pages. So just turn over in your Bible to John chapter 2, and we'll pick this up. And while you're turning, I'm going to want to, uh, I, I will, I will uh, hit a couple of the high points while you're looking. The reason why Jesus did these signs are, are, are for these reasons. Sign one, when he turns water into wine, it points to Jesus as the source of life. Sign two, he heals a nobleman's son, which shows Jesus is the master of distances. Sign three, he heals a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. It proves that Jesus is the master of time. Sign four, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, proves that Jesus is the bread of life. Sign five, when Jesus walks on water and stills a storm, proves that Jesus is the master over nature. Sign six, when Jesus heals a blind man who was born blind, it shows that Jesus is the light of the world. In sign seven, Jesus, ra Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. It proves that Jesus has power over death. Can you say amen, somebody? Aren't you thankful for that? So Jesus saves the best for last. John chapter 2. Just look, look over at your neighbor make sure they've got, they, they, they've got the right page there. We're going to read the whole thing. And so just follow along with me, please. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, by the way, that was not a disrespectful remark. It was a respectful, reverential remark, actually. What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to, to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Say that with me, please. Ready? Whatever he says to you, one more time. Whatever he says to you, do it. Friend, if you don't remember anything else tonight, you remember that one thing. It will serve you well. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Amen? Let's keep going. Now, there were set, there are six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servants you see right there in parentheses but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him every man at the beginning at the beginning somebody say at the beginning every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have have well drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now the, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him after this he went down to Capernaum his mother he his mother his brothers and disciples and they did not stay there many days Let, let's go back to this 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 miracle Jesus reverses the custom of the day. The custom was you serve the best booze first. Why? Because drunk people don't know if it's good wine or bad wine. Now none of you none of us have any experience with that. Amen somebody? Just give me the happy dog. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we don't know anything about that, but we do know this. Jesus reverses this for a reason. Why? Think about this for a moment. It's a sign to you and to me. It was a sign to his disciples. I could have served the best first, but I'm saving the best for last. Do you know what you and I, what our life, we got bumps and bruises, come on, amen, somebody. We, we got, we've been through all kinds of stuff. Sometimes life throws you a curveball. Some, sometimes it doesn't make any sense what we, what we have to endure, does it? But Jesus is saving the best for last. Hallelujah. Jesus is saving the best for last. So we may not get everything we want on the, in, the, in, the, in the present. We may have to endure some things. In fact, we will. Sorrow comes to us all. There's a measure of suffering that I don't care if you're, unless you... Go in your sleep, and you know that's how I, that's how I plan to go. But anyway, um, if you if you know, however, 
we're, we're going to suffer. Jesus promised it. But he saves the best for last. That means that no matter what I have to face, I can make it because I know that the best is just ahead. Amen? Just know your neighbor and tell them, the best is yet to come. Now, look on the other side and tell them, the best is yet to come. Jesus saves the best for last. The second miracle is John chapter 4. Verse 43. Man, I wish I could preach on John 4 all night. But it's, a, it's one of my most favorite chapters in the Bible. And after the two days he departed, John, John 4, 43, after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had, he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son. He was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word. Let's read, that last, let's read that last sentence together. Ready? You ready? So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. I've often wondered what would have happened if he had not believed the word. Hmm. Let's keep going. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. What did Jesus say? Your son lives. You see it? It's almost like this guy heard him, didn't he? Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at, that, at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. I'm going to talk to you for a minute about belief. It's amazing to me how many people, when you talk to them about spiritual things, and you say something about praying for someone who is sick or someone who is injured or whatever, and they, they look at you with this almost pathetic, like, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, how many ever seen that? They look at you like, well, you must be crazy. Or maybe you just, you've got an issue or something, but you believe that this God you pray to hears you and, and, and does what you ask? And I think, when I, when I read this, this story, one of the reasons I love it so much is because, because the validation of what Jesus said. Now this man, this, this servant that comes out and meets him, he, wasn't, he did not hear Jesus say that. He wasn't there. But he goes and meets the, noble, the nobleman and he says, he says, your son lives. Do you see it? Verse 51, do you see it, saints? Your son lives. Say it with me. Your son lives. He, he inquired of him of them the hour when he got better and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Let me tell you something. When Jesus sends his word, it's done. Hallelujah, somebody. It's done right then. I don't know what you think, but I believe that the reason, Pastor Mike, I think the reason why this is in the Bible is because we know that when Jesus says something, he means it right. It, no, well, it'll happen. No, it happened. Because, because look at verse number, number 50. When Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives, the man believed. Somebody shout, believed. Believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. You know what I believe, and I can't prove this, but it's, it's, in, the, it's, in, it's in Randall's uh, emphatic dialogue of the Holy Bible. I, I believe that he went out. I, I believe that the man, at that moment when he believed it, I think he ran home. 
That's just, just, I know, I know, I know. Probably took a week otherwise. But I, I, think, he was, I think he was singing the whole way. I've got a feeling everything's going to be, come on. You, you know, when, G, when, when you get a word, when you get a word, you need to hold on to that word. It's not, well, I'm not sure. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. If, when God says something, listen, honey, you can take it to the bank. You, you, you hide it in your heart. You, you, you shield that word. You cover that word. Don't you let that word go. Nudge your neighbor and tell him, don't you let it go. Don't, don't do it. No, you, you hold on to that word. If Jesus says it, it's done. This. I, I would, I just, when I get to heaven, I'm going to watch the replay. I want to see that. I want to see the whole, I bet there was some dancing. I bet there was some, it was, it was awesome. I, I love this. The father, the father knew it was at verse 53. If you're there, say amen. So, so the father knew, knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself, now watch this. Four words that changed his whole life and his whole household. Some people say, well, you know, signs and wonders, they're not necessary. We got the word. The sign and wonder happens when people believe the word. His whole household. Pastor Mike, they had a revival, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I know that they did. It says here, this is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. I don't know about you, but the longer I live and the more I know Jesus, I am so thankful. How many of you remember when you, heard, when you heard his word for the first time? When he called you? Would you take anything for that? It's the most priceless moment in our lives, is it not? So Jesus, I love it, Jesus heals and makes whole. Heals and makes whole. Now, John chapter 5, are you there? Jesus restores body and soul. This is a man healed at the pool of Bethesda. After this, there was, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep's gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these, in these porches lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Do you find it fascinating that Jesus would ask him that? Why, why would he have laid there 38 years if he did not want to get well? Jesus knew something about human nature that you and I sometimes miss. Some people who are laying around don't want anything, don't want no help. They want your pity, but they don't want your help. No, Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus has, has pity for him. Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been in that condition a long time. A ask him, think about this. Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, notice Jesus didn't counsel him. Jesus didn't say, let's talk about it. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Uh-oh, we just hit a, road bump, a speed bump. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, now not Jesus, they talked to the man who had been healed. You see the word cured there? It means made whole. Not, not a little bit, not, not 99%, all of it. Jesus, this man was made whole. He was cured. It is the Sabbath, they said. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, I love it. He turns into a theologian just like that. Watch this. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed and, and uh, uh, healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. 
after Jesus found him in the, in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. You know, these people were seething. You know, those religious leaders, they were having a, a conniption because Jesus broke protocol. He did something when you shouldn't have. There's other days. There's six other days he can heal. It's the Sabbath. You don't do that on the Sabbath. Why did Jesus do that? Jesus did it for one reason. He's proven to us one thing. People are more important than everything else. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees and Sadducees says, no, men serve the law. And Jesus says, no, the law serves man. He did not deny the law. He simply said, there's a higher law than that one. That when there's human need, God restores. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to check out that film too. I want to see it. I want to see the man. I want to see, I want to see his face. I want to see when, those, when the Pharisees and the religious leaders run up to him and start to interrogate him. I want to see what he looks like. They're looking at this guy. They, they saw him for 38 years in that condition. And then when they saw him, instead of saying, instead of having a Holy Ghost hoedown, woohoo, he's, he's healed. What'd they do? They interrogate him. They said, wait a second, this happened on the Sabbath. You know, Sabbaths are important. But what's more important? What's more important is God's handiwork. What's more important is a person in need, and no matter what day it is or what season or whatever, that need gains the heart of God. Can you say amen? And so Jesus ministers life to him. That's another one of the signs in this, in this wonderful gospel. Look over at John chapter 6. These are all close together, aren't you thankful? Little becomes much in his hands. How many of you ate tonight before you came? How many of you hungry? You should have been here. I'm just telling you, you should have been here. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs. See that? You see the word signs? They saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But he said this to test him. You see that? But, he, but this he said, he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread or is not sufficient for them, for that every one of them may have little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Jesus believed in order. Hallelujah. Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he, had bro uh, when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Do you see that? If you highlight your Bible, you probably want to, you want to highlight that right there, as much as they wanted. See, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to give you a bite. Jesus said, I'm going to fill you to full, all of it. So when they were filled, somebody say filled. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign, another sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. What's the meaning of this sign? Jesus has everything you need. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient. Okay, I'll leave that alone. But anyway, but Jesus, he's all you need. How many got Jesus in your heart? How many, Jesus is your counselor? Jesus is your comforter, wave at me. Guess what? You got all you need. He's going to make whatever, you, whatever situation, whatever season, whatever time, whatever you need, Jesus will be right there and he will provide everything you need. I love this. Let me turn back on page, my next my, my page before. John, uh, uh, look at verse number 11 one more time. Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. Say it with me. 
as much as they wanted. See, God's provision will always exceed your need. Some people only want what, Lord, I just want a bare minimum. Be careful, you might get what you ask for. Hey, amen. I heard this said say, uh, say one time, there was a minister, uh, and I was just a baby Christian, and he was on TV, and uh, he said this, he said, don't insult God with your pitiful request. Ask big, because God is a big God. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting the tears running down my face, I'm like, that's big. And I'm starting to think, what's big? I want, how many of you, if you're going to a buffet, you don't get you a piece of chicken? Come on, talk to me. You get play, three plates of chicken. Actually, you're exactly right. She's, she's a Randall. She knows this is how we do things. G Jesus gives them all they wanted. Look at that one more time. What does he say? As much as they wanted. My friend, I came here tonight to tell you one thing. Jesus has as much as you want. That's exactly what he wants to give you. He didn't want to give you a piddling amount or just a, just a barely getting by. People, it blows my mind how many people are willing to, they, they, will, they will skimp. They'll trust, they'll trust the government to give them everything they want. They won't trust God. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. overflowing. Amen. Amen. Little becomes much in his hands. What do you got? What do you need? Think about that boy a day. Five loaves and two fish. What is that? And these weren't like catfish or fat fish. They were, they were what did Jesus do? Remember the song we used to sing, honey? Little as much. When God is in it, labor not. Keep going. You can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. No, you never tell them little as much. John six fifteen. I'm so glad you're here tonight. I appreciate you. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed. Again to the mountain by himself alone. And when evening came, his disciples went to, down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, read those words when we ready. It is I. Out loud. It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which the disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, and whether other boats came from the Tiberias near the place where they had ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. See, when Jesus meets your need, how, most of us, I don't know how you got saved. I, I was not at a meeting. I'd never been inside a church except for a funeral. A real church, a Christian church, except for a funeral, one time in my whole life. But when Jesus walks into your world, you got every answer you ever needed. Put your hand right there. Do you realize what you're carrying tonight? Do you realize what you're carrying? The hope of the world lives in you. That's why when, when, when I know that you got what I got going on. There's, there's people that you'll see in the next few weeks at your family reunion or, or holiday gatherings that don't think that much about your God, but they know he lives in you. You make sure that Jesus is evident. Can you say amen, somebody? You can take it down. I love that. Jesus said, it is I. Do not be afraid. Hmm. Fear has no hold on you. 
Jesus has power over nature. There's a lot of things going on in our world right now. You probably see the headlines and hear things on the news. How many of you would agree with me? The last two and a half years have been straight from hell. Wave at me. Just, I mean, there's things we hear now and things that are, that are in the, on the airwaves that literally, if you and I were not anchored in Christ, I'm talking lockstep, rock solid in Christ, we would lose our ever-loving minds, would we not? I know why people take drugs. I would too if I, if I didn't know Jesus. Amen. But, but, but the thing is, we, we have an anchor. Jesus is the anchor of our souls. It doesn't matter how, how, how hard the wind blows or how high the waves go. Jesus has got us. We, we're in the palm of his hand. And he's not going to forsake you. He will not let you go. He will not let you fail. I had a friend years ago that uh, he, uh, he had some issues, moral issues, and and, and, and I won't go into all the details, but anyway, he, he embarrassed his family. He lost his marriage. He was ready to quit. He, he was going to take his life. Had nothing to live for. This is back before cell phones. His name was Donnie. I said, Donnie, when you get to that point, call me. Promise me you'll call me. Okay. So one, one afternoon, about 10 minutes to 5, I was at work in Hoover, Alabama. And uh, the phone rings. I picked it up, and Donnie's on the phone crying. I said, Donnie, where are you? I can't tell you. What are you doing? I can't tell you. How can I get to you? I can't tell you. And I said, Donnie, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, you put every, whatever you got in your hand down right now. In Jesus' name, you will live and not die. Do you hear me? My boss is behind me, and he's, well, what are you doing? Man, I was in the spirit. I, listen, when Jesus lives in you, you don't have reason to pull the plug. Amen. And no matter what you, listen, we can get our, into our, ourselves in some deep messes sometimes. Amen, somebody? Even Christians. But when you get there, instead of looking around and looking down, no, look up. Jesus is there. He's not going to abandon you. Jesus has power over nature. I'm thankful. I'm thankful tonight that he's all I need. Now, John chapter 9. You there? Are you there? Say amen. John 9. Jesus gives sight in two dimensions. This is a long passage. Now, see, it's one thing for someone who goes blind. It's another for a man that's born blind. This is totally different. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now watch what his disciples do. This is crazy. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, he was born blind. You know why? Because they believed that sin caused all disease. If, you were, if a person was sick, somebody in their generations was guilty of something. And it got on them. You know, there's some people in church that believe that now. Horrible, horrible lie. Yes. You're exactly right. And, 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 you know, excuse me for a second. Me and Sharon will have a talk. That's just plumb stupid. You know it. Okay. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now watch this. Jesus tells, tells us something here. that it, again, this, this should serve us when we see a situation we don't understand. Watch what Jesus says. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, comma, but. Somebody shout, But but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So, so if, if a condition is, is, exists in a person and God permitted it, it's, it's not because he sinned or his parents sinned. It's because God will manifest his glory in that person and, and, and heal them. Jesus says this, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the, with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, it's going to kick up a fuss, I'm just telling you. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? 
Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am the man. I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus. Hallelujah. A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him, who was formerly blind, to the Pharisees. Uh-oh. Now it was, here we go again. Now it was a what? Sabbath. It was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Do you get the feeling sometimes that Jesus does stuff like this just to prove he can do what he wants when he wants? It was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Wow. And here's the reason. Watch this. This, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. That's pretty, pretty, pretty bad when, when people who are wrong get confused together. Amen. Then they said to the blind man, again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, they're interrogating the man's parents. They asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself, by the way. Of age is 30. So he was 30, 30 plus. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone, if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24, so they, asked, they, they again called the man who was blind, again, 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 and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Hmm. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, though, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Ooh, man, daggers. We know that God spoke to Moses. Watch what they say. Watch what the, what, what, what the religious leaders say, describes the Pharisees. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where, where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, from, yet he opened my eyes. Now, this, the, the man is talking now, the, 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 the blind man who can see. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not, a, not from God, he could do nothing. How many of you agree that's a pretty good sermon for somebody who just met Jesus? They answered and said to him, You are completely born in sin. And you're teaching us, and they cast him out. Then Jesus heard they'd cast him out, verse 35. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Now, I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus ask him then if he believed in the Son of God? It's one thing to believe for a miracle. It's another to believe in the miracle worker. Some people want, they want to believe for, for an act, for a miracle but they don't want to believe in the, the one who caused the miracle. Watch this, watch this. He answered and said, who is he, Lord? See, he didn't even know. Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. This is the third DVD I'm going to rent when I get to heaven. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, watch this, this is powerful. For judgment, I, I have come into this world 
that those who do not see may see. Notice this, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. Hmm. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. There's a blindness worse than physical blindness. That's the blindness of the heart. How many appreciate the fact that when you were, you and I, when we were at our worst, Jesus saw our need. And he gave us sight. Hallelujah, somebody. I once was blind, but now I see. Glory to God. So Jesus gives sight in two dimensions. He saw physically, but then he saw spiritually. Thank God for the healing of the natural man, the natural eyes, but thank God more for the healing of the spiritual man. Jesus restored both, gave sight in two dimensions. And the last sign is in John chapter 11. Y'all doing all right? Okay. I'm so glad you came to church tonight. This is a powerful story of a very, very close and dear friend of Jesus. Verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Notice that. He whom you love. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you? Listen, if I could be called anything, Don, I want to be known as he whom you love. Amen? He whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Uh Uh-oh. That was a strange statement there, wasn't it? When he heard he was sick, he went right to him. No, that's not what happened. Comma, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, later the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. Do you see that? Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I mean, some people just don't get it. So Jesus had to bust it down for him. Lazarus is dead. Say it with me. Lazarus, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Wow. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Hmm. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I love this but. But. Somebody say it with me. But. Even now. I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, read it with me, please, ready? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. Verse 28, and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. 
Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. See that? He groaned. Read it with me, please. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This is a deep anguish. A, an anguish of soul so deep, words can't express it. It's a guttural earthquake. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus groans in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, verse 36, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again groaning in himself. See it? Two times there. He groans in the spirit in verse 33. He groan, he's groaning in himself in verse 38. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Then Jesus said, take away the stone. Say it with me out loud. Take away the stone. One more time. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Say it out loud with me, somebody. Loose him and let him go. When someone who is lost in sin begins to feel a tugging in the heart and begins to recognize there's a life and a power and a voice and an authority and a God bigger than me and begins to point their heart toward, toward that direction. They're like a person that's wrapped in, in, in grave clothes. Juan, you remember when you heard that sound for the first time? How many, many remember the day you were saved? Hallelujah. Raise it one more time. Stand with me, would you? Stand, just stand up. Wow. Look at this room. There's miracles in this room. If you believe you were once dead, but now you're alive. Hallelujah. The next time someone says, have you ever seen a miracle? You're looking at one. That's not, not in an arrogant way. It's just reality. Let's, let's just bless the Lord for a moment. Father, thank you. Thank you for saving us. We were lost and had no interest in you whatsoever. Lord, because of your great mercy, an astounding grace. Even when we were dead in sin and trespasses, even then, you set your heart on us. And you woke us up out of that death sleep. You breathed life into us. You called us out of darkness. Hallelujah. Into your marvelous light. And right now, Father, we are children of light. Just like Lazarus, bound and dead for four days inside a tomb. But when you called him out, he came out, came out bound and walked away free. And Father, you've done the very same thing in us. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, tell him, saints. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your extravagant mercy. Thank you for your compassion.
for your grace, so amazing. God, we're so thankful for what you've done in us. And Father, we pray for our loved ones who do not know you tonight, whether they be sibling, parent, aunt, uncle, cousin, grandparent, whoever they may be. Father, in the name of Jesus, do for them what you've done for me. Call them out of that tomb. Awaken them. Call their name, hallelujah, and raise them up in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for the miracles that are in this room tonight. Lord, this week we're going to interact with people who do not know you. They may be co-workers, they may be somebody at the grocery store or the wherever we may, we may go, we're going we're gonna to rub shoulders with this week with people who do not know you. Many of them are walking in a stupor. They're completely and totally blind, just like we once were. And Father, I've heard your spirit the last several weeks, time and time and time again, say, let your light shine. God, our mandate in this season of darkness is to let our light shine. Because we did not generate that light. That light lives in us. Because Jesus lives in us. We have something to say to the world. We give hope. We shine that light. That others may come out of darkness. And know freedom. And hope. And love. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, bring your binder back. No. No. Hold on, I got, I got an announcement. I just remembered it. Next week is the week of Thanksgiving. We don't meet on Wednesdays on the week of Thanksgiving. So uh, what we didn't cover tonight, and plus all the handouts you got that are in, in, in the binder there, take it with you and read it. And, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, on Sunday morning, okay? God bless you.